Hey, welcome to the Daddy Curbs Farm. We are still at the Homesteading Life Conference with Doug and Stacy, and I have a guest here. You guys already know who he is, Dr. Leo, who is an amazing beekeeper. This morning we were sitting around the table and he was just talking about different beekeeping things and I thought, I really want to get this on video and he promised me that he would come out here and do a special video just for you guys. So it's all yours, Dr. Leo. Yeah, thanks. It's my pleasure to Blake. And there, I always are, love to talk about natural beekeeping because today you hear so many bad news about the bees. Bees disappearing and dying and collapsing. But where are the good news? Mm -hmm. I'm a small scale beekeeper. I only have 40 hives. But right now in this country, we have people who have thousands of beehives and they never treat their bees with chemicals or they produce wonderful honey and they have surplus bees for sale every year. So what is their secret? Well, there is no real secret. Uh, it's not the opinion of some beekeepers or the experience of some beekeepers. If we look at the foundations of bee biology, we have all the answers there. And the reason today there is so much problem with the keeping your bees alive and there, at the same time there are so many beekeepers who do so successfully is that with honeybees, just as with any other animal organisms or plant, it is very important to be working with the local strain of bees, the ones that are adapted to the local weather patterns. It would only make sense that if you plant uh, a fruit tree, you would want to plant a fruit tree that mm -hmm. would thrive in your climate. Yep. If you live in Minnesota and you order a plant from a tropical Florida nursery, fat chance that it will thrive there uh, even to get it survive the winter we'll need to provide all the protection and put it in a greenhouse uh, the same applies to the honeybees and here is where the problem resides most of the honeybees sold today in America belong to two strains of European honeybee this is the Italian honeybee native to the south of Italy and Carniolan bee, native to the south of Europe as well. Both of these strains are southern honeybees and they were great if you live in the south. For example, the Italian honeybee comes from the climate where there is summer or things in bloom for 10 months out of 12. So if you have a climate like that, these bees may perform very well. But if you live in Wisconsin and you have the bees that, play, uh, that are programmed by nature uh, for the climate that has blooming plants are uh, 10 months out of 12, then you have a big problem. And this problem is not just the adaptation to the winter. We are not just talking about these bees not being able to survive the cold. They're very hard in this respect. But we are talking about these southern bees being out of sync with the blooming of local plants. And this is extremely important. We think about the bees as insects that live in bee trees or that live inside hive boxes that we uh, create for them. But you need to be thinking about the honeybees as the extension of the local ecosystem mm. and the local environment, especially the flowering plants. If there are no flowering plants, the honeybees cannot thrive no matter how well adapted they are to the cold or how hardy they can be in terms of disease resistance. So, you take a bee that expects that there will be honey flow, that means nectar in flowers, from uh, February until uh, late November. You place it in the climate where the only time flowers are available, say from late April to July. What will happen? The queen is programmed to lay eggs in anticipation of the availability of flowers. So they raise an army of foragers to go out and collect this nectar. So if they do it out of sync with the blooming of local plants, that means not only they wasted the valuable resources on raising and heating and taking care of this brood, but they produced a useless generation of bees that are unemployed. They have no nectar to collect. And this is such a big problem because economically it is more profitable to raise bees here in America in the south for the very simple reason. You can start breeding queens and honeybees much earlier in the year. You can keep going uh, in February and even January if you are in Florida or Georgia 
so you will have queens and bees to sell as early as April. If I were to try to sell you a queen raised here in Missouri, there is no way I would be able to deliver her before June 1st. So the businesses who raise bees in the south have the time advantage. Everyone wants to have bees early in the spring, so to take advantage of the early flows and nectar in May. So people keep buying southern bees even realizing that these are not the bees that would be a good match to this environment. Mm. So, and it's not only the problem for the north. I was presenting on natural beekeeping north of San Francisco in San Rafael this year and people there are screaming too that they are getting the bee packages and queens that are out of sync with the blooming of the local plants. Uh, they have a dearth uh, in the summer, it's too dry, few flowers in the bloom, but if you have a queen that's programmed to expand, expect a continuous flow of nectar in nature, she will keep producing the brood and all this new brood won't be able to bring in any new nectar, but they will consume the honey reserves that the honey mm. has collected early in the season. And this is where all this practice of feeding your bees sugar comes from. You open old books written in the 19th century devoted to beekeeping, you won't read about sugar feeding in any of them. Why? Why weren't bees, uh, why weren't bees fed sugar back in the 19th century and why is it the universal practice today? The answer is very simple. Back in the 19th century everyone was using local bees. It couldn't be otherwise. There wasn't FedEx to deliver you a package of bees from Florida or Queens from Hawaii overnight. So the only way people could have bees is to catch some local swarms. And this is the way we can still restore and rely upon the local honeybee populations. Instead of buying bees from elsewhere, no matter how productive they are said to be, no matter how disease resistant they are said to be, Instead, you can have a very reliable and free and sustainable option of catching local swarms. It's easier than you may think. All the bees living in bee trees in the woods, behind siding in cities, or in somebody's beehives, they procreate by swarming. They raise a new queen and the queen flies off with half the bees in the beehive to found a new colony. So if you set out a box in the spring on a tree uh, that uh, is lured with the two smells that bees like, you can look them up on my website, horizontalhive.com. There is a free swamp catching guide there. But if you have the right kind of box in the right spot in the spring, the bees move into these boxes as reliably as birds move into bird houses. A hundred years ago, this was the only way people were getting their stock, and this is still the simplest and uh, way of obtaining local stock and start keeping bees with a smile of your face instead of struggling with the uh, failing colonies and trying to use such and such chemical or such and such antibiotic to keep them alive. That's good stuff. Yeah, and you know, again, it's not my opinion. It's not a uh, zombie keeper's opinion. It's really the reality of how honeybees are designed to live. And uh, the principle of natural beekeeping, look how bees live in nature and just replicate them in your beehives. Today we have solid scientific evidence that if you go into the wilderness and track a certain colony living in the wilderness, their average lifespan, say in upstate New York, is more than six years. For the colony? Yeah, for the colony. They will be living in the same bee tree for more than six years wow. on average. That means on average there are some colonies that keep going for eight, ten years. Uh, so if you hear beekeepers say that they have trouble keeping bees alive even for a couple of years and they need to do all kinds of management and using such and such medicines to try to save their colonies and at the same time we have these robust colonies that just thrive in the wilderness then you realize that we're doing something terribly wrong right. if we're screwing it up so royally. Right, so when we fight nature and this is part of um, I don't talk a lot about permaculture on my channel but it is something that, that I use to filter 
thoughts and ideas through is the permaculture mindset and if you're fighting nature uh, nature in the end is gonna win so you're gonna you're gonna lose your methods are gonna lose you have to find a way to work in harmony with nature so I love your message about and working with yeah bees. that's such a good point because you know if you think about it holistically even something that is perceived as a bad thing for example parasites or disease that kill the bees uh, beekeepers are trying to fight these diseases with chemicals well the same way as we do in human medicine trying to kill infection with antibiotics and their mm -hmm. other uh, unnatural methods but uh, think about it in uh, looking at the bigger picture what these parasites and disease are doing in nature with the honeybees they're eliminating and culling the weak colonies so that the strongest and the most adapted colonies can stay and reproduce you read it in biology textbooks uh, uh, right there in school it's called natural selection and these principles apply to all living organisms including the honeybees so if you start fighting these parasites you may save this particular colony from death but what you also did you perpetuated the colony that has no natural adaptation right. and now it has a chance to reproduce and their progeny will be as dependent on your continued chemical treatments or medicines or drugs as the mother colony was there are entire countries where treating your bees against disease with chemicals or antibiotics is not allowed by the government cuba is one example they have 160,000 colonies on the island and they're thriving without any medicines why because they allowed natural selection to take its course the weak colonies disappeared the strong ones were left uh, to reproduce so one year to the next the quality of your stock keeps improving uh, what do you say I think something about uh, this morning you said five years it takes to turn if you let them reproduce locally a colony will create a sustainable well yeah breed, it, it happens fairly quickly we know it from the research that was done in Europe they put a number of bees or beehives, like a hundred plus beehives, on an island. And they looked what happened. They were not treating them against the varomites. This is the parasite that transmits viruses that kill a lot of bees in this country to the present day. So they looked and there, after a few years there were only a handful of beehives left. Uh, but the ones that were left there were the ones that had natural resistance so they kept reproducing and repopulated the island a few years later with the resilient stock so in the long run this is the only way of working with honeybees relying not on bees that you order from the other side of the country or maybe even from the subtropical climate but working with the local bees that are adapted to the local conditions, to the diseases that may be in the environment, and to the pattern of blooming of your local plants. That is all amazing and so much good information. Many of you who follow me know that I do beekeeping and it's been a journey, a struggle. I have some good seasons, some bad seasons. I tend to make mistakes. Um, some of my mistakes, I believe, have been because I've listened to uh, the advice of too many people, too many different methods, and a lot of those methods include uh, our current conventional ideas that is treatments and requeening all the time and all those things where if I would have focused early on with letting my colonies reproduce locally, um, I potentially could have a very sustainable uh, bee yard apiary. So I know there is some concern about hot bees which is why I moved my, my, uh, my bee yard further away from the house. And that's something that I have to learn to work with. But even that, we shared this morning uh, that as long as they're not next to people and going to cause a problem, those hotter bees, some would say Africanized, are actually very good, durable, producing bees. Yeah, and disease-free, because if they can defend themselves from you, they can defend themselves from varomites or other pests. Right. Actually, throughout Latin America, the only honeybee left uh, to work with is the Africanized bee, and the beekeepers there keep them very successfully. It's not as pleasant to keep as the more docile European races like the Italians. It can stand for itself, but with proper management, 
uh, you can minimize intrusion into the nest and still keep these bees that are again staying treatment free and disease free uh, without any help from the humans. And you know another thing that you mentioned that I would like to emphasize is that that's something that anyone can do. However, because the honeybee is made outside the beehive in flight, if you are the one realizing the importance of our uh, maintaining and developing uh, and nurturing a local strain of bees but everyone around you keep buying packages from outside your region they're saturating this area with the drones that means the male bees they do not belong here and your queens are, that have some local adaptation they fly and they mate with the non-local drones this will be constantly undermining their local adaptation so it's a bad and a good thing it's a bad thing because it means you either need to be isolated to be able to do that with no beekeepers within the flight range of your bees, which is probably at least five miles. And uh, second, it's a blessing because this means that we can only solve this problem working together like honeybees right. do. Yeah. Either you need to convert other beekeepers around you and explain you know, the benefits of doing it this way, but the tide is already turning many people still do it the old way with chemicals and treatments but it's awfully expensive and unhealthy if you look at the chemicals that are proved to be used inside the beehive these are suspected human carcinogens and the stuff you need to be applying wearing a full protection chemical suit i don't want this stuff in my honey in you know something that i put either on my children's plate or on the plate of other people i want it to be helpful simple and done with a smile, you know. Uh, I, I translated a book from Russian, which is a classical book on keeping bees uh, in a low stress way. It's called Keeping Bees with a Smile. And it's exactly that. Not only it's helpful, but it becomes a pleasurable occupation instead of requiring constant struggle and trying to battle, paddle against the stream, against the flow. And another book that I translated from French called Keeping Bees in Horizontal Hives. For me, it's also the way of making it in a way that would be a pleasurable, uh, not stressful on the bees, not stressful on the people, and something you can do as a family. The horizontal hives like this are prevalent in many parts of Europe. I was born and raised in Russia, so I was introduced to them as a kid. They have frames on one level, so you do not have a stack of many boxes, and that means that there is no heavy lifting involved. And one of the big advantages of this is that children, there are two of my daughters on the cover, even children can be useful in the apiary and be introduced to natural beekeeping methods or without all the stress and aggression that you will witness from honeybees when you manage them using conventional ways. I have a website called horizontalhive.com No where, S. No S singular because horizontal hives is a kind of disease the hives the, the rash that you have on the skin uh, I have nothing to do with that so horizontal hive singular dot com I have a lot of free information there a free guide to catching your own swarm and enhancing the local strains of honeybees and also free plans for building your own bee equipment it shouldn't be expensive for you to get started you build your own box put it on a tree in the springtime and not only you will be enjoying unpolluted locally produced honey, but you will actually contribute to enhancing and saving local honeybee populations. That's awesome. That, that's Sorry, I have one final okay, thought. Okay, go ahead. I know I keep uh, uh, talking and talking, but my final thought that when you work with local bees, you can support local wilderness at the same time. We think about a productive use of the land as it being either cut down for timber or being converted to agriculture. But bees are unique allies because they can allow us to use wilderness beneficially, even in economic terms, instead of needing to cut down trees or convert acreages to pastures or intensive cropping. You can keep it under natural vegetation, which has all these amazing benefits uh, in the big picture and scheme of things while providing livelihood there for your family at the same time. That's a lot of beekeeping information. I really appreciate you taking the time to sit with me. It's my pleasure. We did this in one take. Yes. That's amazing. Hey, you guys, check out HorizontalHive.com. Get his books. Uh, the horizontal hives that I recently had built for the Daddy Curbs farm will be in use hopefully later this year, hopefully to make Dr. Leo proud. 
and I do look forward to seeing more of your stories in the comments below and in the family group over on Facebook. Thanks, Dr. Leo. Yeah, welcome. All the best. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.